I am thrilled to announce our keynote speaker for today, a true champion for children, Dr. C. Kirabo Jackson. Dr. Jackson, one of the leading experts in the economics of education, was recently appointed as a member of President Biden's Council of Economic Advisors. Dr. Jackson is the Abraham Harris Professor of Education and Social, Social Policy at Northwestern University. His work has been published in the highest impact economics journals and his research findings have garnered attention from numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Bloomberg, and others. In 2020, Dr. Jackson was elected to the National Academy of Education and received the David N. Kershaw Award from the Association from Public Policy Analysis and Management in recognition of his contributions to the field of public policy analysis and management. In 2020, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, an honor that celebrates excellence and leadership across various disciplines and practices. Dr. Jackson, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you to everyone who's put in the uh, hard work to make this uh, event uh, a real thing. And also thank you all for the work that you do. It's really important. Um, I am thrilled uh, to be here at a summit focused on the importance of investing in children. Um, by way of introduction, before joining the Council of Economic Advisors, I was a professor at Northwestern University. Um, much of my research had focused on key questions, one of which was, does uh, money matter for kids? And specifically, does school spending matter? Now, I don't have to tell anyone in this particular room what the answer to that question is, but a lot of what I've been doing for the past 20 years has been trying to create uh, the most rigorous, high-quality research uh, documenting the benefits of investing in our children, both in terms of their short-run outcomes and their long-run outcomes. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about that research and what it teaches us about how we should invest in our children. And then I'm going to sort of remind us how we can see these priorities reflected in the actions of this administration and the work that we have ahead of us. So in the research world, there's been a long-standing debate regarding whether increasing the financial resources available to public schools actually improves the outcomes of children and particularly the outcomes of children from disadvantaged backgrounds. So there are really two main arguments made by the skeptics of increasing school spending. The first, is that while money may matter at very low levels, given the spending levels that we have in, in the United States, increasing school spending is not gonna really do much good. The second argument is that the differences that we observe between those from advantaged and less advantaged backgrounds has to do with things that happen in the home, and as such, the government has very little to do about that. But it turns out neither of these arguments is consistent with the data. Now, I don't wanna bore you today with details about methodology or go through the history of the research but I'll just give you the punchline, which is that money matters. It matters a lot. It matters for the most vulnerable groups. And beyond that, it matters exactly how we spend it. So working with co-authors in 2016, we published a landmark study on school finance reforms. So we document that when money flows into schools as a result of the passage of state school level finance reforms, these schools improve in ways that allows them to better serve their children. More money led to lower student teacher ratios, increases in teacher pay, longer school years, and all of this means more time for learning for students. Importantly, we show that the students who attended these schools after these reforms had markedly improved outcomes later on in life compared to students who attended these same schools before the reforms. They had more years of educational attainment, higher earnings, and lower levels of adult poverty. Importantly, these, these benefits were particularly pronounced for children from lower income families. So one of the key findings that we found was that these investments actually pay for themselves, which is to say that every dollar that we invested in the public school system paid off in terms of two additional dollars in earnings later on. So in sum, when we invest in public schools, they're better able to serve our kids and it is worth the expense. So since then, I, along with some co-authors and other collaborators as well, have done a lot of additional work to establish that this relationship is indeed a fact. So let there be no doubt that money does matter and that increased spending in schools and also elsewhere meaningfully improves the outcomes of children in both the short run and in the long run. So moving now beyond the question of if money matters, the next step is to figure out how we should spend it. We 
Research spanning many disciplines, including some from my CEA colleagues, has documented that there are large benefits to investing in the earliest years of a child's life. Early experiences in education and childcare are influential for children both in the short run, in terms of things such as school readiness, socio-emotional development and cognitive development, but also in the long run, looking at outcomes such as ed educational attainment, executive functioning, reduced criminality, employment and earnings. For example, in work that I'd done with Dr. Rucker Johnson, we find that children who had access to Head Start when they were four years old, basically earned about 10% more than children who had no, no such access at that same age. Importantly, the returns on these investments manifest not only as improved outcomes for the individuals, but also for society as a whole. We see this in terms of improved public safety. We see this in terms of greater productivity and greater economic growth, things that benefit all of us. So mine and others' research shows that programs targeted at the early years have the greatest potential to generate these large individual and societal benefits, and ultimately they do pay for themselves. Moreover, it's important to point out that these, when, they, when these are well deployed, these, investment, these investments can advance both economic efficiency and also equity. So we know from research that differences between individuals from more and less advantaged backgrounds manifest early in life and they tend to grow as children age. In co-authored work, we show that counteracting these inequities means investing early in children, particularly those from under-resourced communities and, and basically continuing those targeted supports and sustaining them over time. We find that children who experience early investment tend to benefit more from additional support down the road. Specifically, students exposed to, head, exposed to Head Start not only enjoy the direct benefits of Head Start that I mentioned earlier, but they also benefited more from any increased spending in the elementary and secondary school setting. Another way to say this is that investing in Head Start made the K through 12 spending more impactful. Interestingly, what we found was that the combined benefit of growing up in a neighborhood or a place that had both greater Head Start spending and greater K through 12 per pupil spending are significantly, significantly greater than the sum of the independent effects of each in isolation. So I think this is an important lesson to apply to our thinking about funding for children across all ages. It means that not only is the initial investment important, but sustained investments is the key to making our federal dollars work the hardest for children and for the society more broadly. The final bucket of my research that I want to sort of highlight is how we measure student success. So researchers have long been constrained by the types, of, the types of data and the quantity of data that is available to answer important questions. This is particularly true for the measurement of children's success. The tradition in economics has been to use the best measure available, which is typically test scores as a measure of progress. But I think as parents, teachers, and former students, we all know that test scores are a noisy and largely imperfect measure of overall success and a sort of flawed measure of well-being in a general sense. So I've made a push in my own research, and I encourage others to do the same, to expand our definition of success when it comes to children outcomes. So for example, in some work that I've done uh, using data from Chicago with co-authors, we find that some high schools are really good at raising students' test scores. Other high schools are very good at raising and improving students' socio-emotional development, but it's those schools that are able to do both that really have the largest impact on students' long-run outcomes and measured by educational attainment and likely earnings down the road. So our students are whole individual people and we should treat their progress accordingly. As such, I would argue that in addition to test scores, which is an important component, we should focus also on measuring and also promoting socio-emotional outcomes such as, such as, you know, yeah, and also behavioral progress. And these are all metrics that allow us to best capture and nurture the entire child. Now, this is what we know from research. So I wanna pivot and talk about how this sort of, what this means in terms of real world applications and specifically how the actions of the Biden administration reflect our commitment to children of all ages. So first and foremost, I wanna talk about childcare, a topic that I know is top of mind for many of us here in the room. And I wanna emphasize that a strong childcare system is critical to ensuring the well-being of our young learners, their parents, and their communities. Accessible, high-quality care for the first several years of a child's life 
really helps foster the positive developmental outcomes I just touched upon, but it also allows flexibility for parents to return to work in a meaningful way. At the Council of Economic Advisors, we've identified four key challenges to address in the childcare market. The first challenge is workforce turnover. Early childcare and education workers face low pay, and as a result, providers often see very high staff turnover. This is particularly problematic in this sector because child caregiver relationships are really important and staff continuity are very important ingredients into the early child and education space. Since the pandemic recession, the care workforce has been relatively slower to come back relative to the rest of the workforce, and moreover, these care jobs are held disproportionately by women and, and people of color. The second challenge is providing high quality care is expensive. Early care and education is a labor intensive industry and it's reliant primarily on parents' tuition dollars for revenue. What this means is that providers have limited, uh, limited options to cut costs or raise revenue and in, and in order to make the kinds of changes that would be necessary to provide care of high quality at reasonable cost. The third challenge is that most families simply cannot afford the full cost of childcare, or at least the full cost of high quality childcare. So when childcare prices increase, many families, particularly those from low income families, are forced to forego market-based care altogether, having to rely on parental care, informal sort of arrangements, unpaired care, and often lower quality care, unfortunately. According to the 2019 National Survey on Early Care and Education, Households in the bottom 20% of earners who are paying for childcare are spending about 33% of their budgets on childcare. Even the top 20% of earners are spending 10% of their income on childcare. To address this pressing concern, President Biden's basically childcare agenda aims to keep care spending down to 7% of the family income. So the first three challenges really stem from the fourth, which is that the business model is a fragile one. The early care and educational provider landscape is made up of many small firms. Oftentimes these are sole proprietorships that face startup costs and thin profit margins. Sustaining a childcare business at all is financially challenging. Moreover, it's very hard to build a business that offers a level of quality that research says is necessary to really get the, the, the developmental benefits that we, that we need at a cost that a typical family, let alone a low-income family, can afford. So the Center for American Progress, I don't know if you can actually see those numbers over there, put together the following estimate of two different childcare centers. As you can see, both charge tuition that are simply out of reach for many families. But the plan on the right make some changes that we think are gonna be beneficial both in terms of children's development and also workplace, uh, workplace quality. They basically have higher pay and smaller ratios of students to adults. As you can see with this example, with a tuition of over $2,000 per month, high quality care does not come cheap. So if the business model doesn't work, how do we offer quality services? How do we ensure the well-being of children? So both the demand side, which would be parents, and the supply side, which would be providers of the market need attention. Subsidies for families seeking care and subsidies for providers supplying the early care and education both play a critical role in addressing these market challenges. Supply side sub subsidies tied to the cost of providing high quality care allow providers to invest in costly quality improvements. Demand side subsidies that adjust the price consumers pay based on their income, allow, makes it easier for families to accommodate the high quality care into their budgets. This is why the president's efforts at closing the gap between what ca families can afford and how much it costs to provide high quality care have been comprehensive and inclusive of all types of care. This includes April's executive order on increasing access to high quality care and supporting caregivers, which focuses the federal agencies on the care workforce and family caregivers as a means to increasing access to high quality options. In the bipartisan fiscal year 2023 funding, we secured a 30% increase in child care and development block grants, which helps low-income families afford care, a nearly 10% increase in Head Start, and sizable increase in the preschool development grants to states. And the, federal, the, and the president's fiscal year 2024 budget proposal 
calls for historic investments in childcare and preschool and other investments to ensure that every family has access to affordable, high quality early care. But it's important to note that it isn't just what happens within schools and formal settings that, that affects uh, children's well being. Research shows that investments in kids' nutrition, their neighborhoods, housing, stability, these are all things that improve their long term development. But just earlier this month, we had to face data showing the consequences of the expiration of the expanded child tax credit. President Biden has consistently fought for the expanded CTC because with it, we saw child poverty drop to historically low levels in 2021. Without it, in 2022, we saw child poverty more than double from 5.2% to 12.4%. This means that families lost an important source of income to feed their families, feed their kids, make rent, pay utilities, and send their kids to school with the materials that they need. Now, it's not all bad news. Building on prior progress, the share of Americans without health insurance fell in 2022. 4.3% of children under six and 5.4% of those 18 and younger were uninsured in 2022. This is a decline from 4.5% of children under six and 5.7% of children 18 and younger in 2021. Also, in the past few years, we've seen employment of school health professionals rise, indicating that we're making the needed investments to ensure the overall well being of our kids. From before the pandemic, we've seen a 40% increase in the number of social workers in schools and a 34% increase in the number of school nurses. We've also seen a rise in the number of counselors available to students. These types of supports have been found to improve student well being and socio emotional outcomes. Resources like this are a, really an important first step in prioritizing the entire whole student. So, to close, I've spent nearly my whole academic life studying best practices to improve outcomes for kids. Being a parent myself and having recently joined the Biden administration, I've now seen this issue from multiple angles. I'm looking forward to continuing the push for policy to support our kids, their families, and their communities with you all. And I look forward to hearing the rest of the conversation here today. Thank you.